Welcome to this uh, first Global Leadership Masterclass of the 2022 series curated by the Open Diplomacy Institute that I'm uh, um, happy to, to lead. Uh, I'll, I'll moderate those uh, six um, Global Leadership Masterclasses we have once a week up to the 28th of June to discuss cross-cutting issues and explore what leadership means in a very, very complex world that is getting at war actually um, it's a program that also brings together uh, different networks uh, of the, uh, the Open Diplomacy Institute, our Parliamentarians for Peace, uh, this transnational and trans transpartisan uh, network of uh, senior MPs stemming from different countries to reflect upon the post-2030 agenda of the UN, as well as leaders of the Y20 and Y7, the outreach groups, towards future generations of the G20 and G7. Uh, this program of the Open Diplomacy Institute is uh, supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France, Global Affairs Canada, and NG that I'm very, very um, thankful uh, for the support. And um, we will start today with a masterclass that is dedicated to a major issue that has been on our mind for the last two years and is still on our mind, um, global health disruptions. And of course, I'm referring to COVID issues that we've been uh, uh, in the midst of for the last um, yeah, 24 months at least. Uh, and to address this issue, I'm very proud to host uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Haik Nikogosian, who has been Minister of uh, Health at uh, the, Armen in the Armenian government. He's now the senior uh, affiliate uh, of the Global Health Center at the Geneva Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. And uh, Haik was also the former head, I should say the first head, called now Head Emeritus of the Secretariat of the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, Haik, I'm, I'm very pleased that you accepted our invitation. We'll start with a discussion with you around your experience and then build up our conversation with four other leaders that I'll be happy to introduce right after we uh, launch this conversation with you and reflect upon your experience. And therefore, I'd like to ask you a first question. I do hope you're, uh, you're fully connected and you can hear me well. Um, my question is that Around 20 years ago, in times where we were not speaking about the pandemics, uh, in the early uh, 2000s, you turned from the Ministry of Health in Armenia to the UN system. And as I said, this was a major shift in your career as I presented you. But I'm, I'm curious to know, um, as a leader, what type of uh, difference this did, did shift made uh, in, in, in your impact uh, on, on global health uh, policy. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you for inviting me to this very interesting seminar and exercise. I uh, appreciate that. And I hope the conversation we have today will be also useful for, uh, for the people who are following us and particularly for the young people whom this is directed to. Uh, uh, am I heard okay? My voice is coming well. It's it's perfectly clear. We can hear Thank you us correctly. Much. Thank you very much. Indeed, I had two big, uh, let's say, uh, fundamentally different uh, parts in my career. One was national, when I climbed, you know, through different positions. You know, I served in a position of uh, clinical director. Then. Uh, to uh, the founding chairman of the Armenian National Public Health Institute, and then as a health minister. And then when I left my ministerial position, I was still in my, my, in my mid forties. So still a bit young to be uh, uh, not only ex minister, but also to think that your career is finished. And when you pick uh, in your country, particularly if it's not a big country, you start to think what else? Uh, that was the decision I had to make 20 years ago, either to stay in the country and continue, but more and less repeat myself after I picked in, the, in a ministerial position. By the way, that was not a political, oh, it was political post, but I was serving a technocrat uh, government 
and being a technical health minister. So it was my a peak of my professional career in the country in, in that way, not political. Or to make another fundamental decision. And I decided to move to international career. I compared that change uh, with changing uh, the orbit. Because if you peak somewhere, there is no way you can further advance in that environment. And you think, okay, maybe I need to, you know, to jump into another orbit where there are another steps to, you know, to to follow and to go. I did that. It is a, a difficult difficult decision. Uh, I think uh, many young people will face that in their career. Uh, and my encouragement is that please do that when you come at that situation, when you feel you picked or you are about to pick your professional career in your country. Think about making a fundamental change, changing your orbit, jumping into the next orbit and find the new ways of improvement and advancement there. So how that in fact uh, impacted my leadership career? Uh, first of all, I got a lot of new motivation because I went to the senior technical expert position, but then uh, I was promoted, I was advancing to very high levels of the WHO, being a head of international treaty, being having a diplomatic and political responsibilities, not only technical, etc. Uh, but also, uh, I felt that decisions I'm making not anymore concern one country, even it's your country, but concern many countries, concern globally, concern internationally. So decisions you make, you have to be very careful because it may impact many, many people, many, many countries in the world. And secondly, that you are working not for any more national interest, but you're working for international interest. Uh, you are working for solidarity in public health issues globally. So that is really differently, uh, fundamentally different to changing your mindset. I can say that it is not just continuing your career. I can tell you that it is a quite dramatic change when you shift from yeah. national to international. I, uh, uh, as what you said, uh, um, not jumping already to the second question, but what you just said m picked my curiosity and I, I was interested in knowing from your window whether there, you feel like there is a difference between uh, public good within a nation and public interest or general interest or public good at the international level. How do you feel the, 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 is it different to make it happen to materialize this consensus? Uh, at the national level and international level? Yes, this interest may not coincide when you are in your country, particularly in a high position, in a country decision-making position, you have to follow the national interest. And they, they not all of this national interest, quite frankly, may coincide with international standards, international threats, et cetera. You have, to, you have to, first of all, follow your national interest, but of course, following the international rules and international standards, et cetera. But when you move to the international career, that is totally different. You more or less forget your country. You forget a national interest at all because you are not even allowed to think about that. You have to, you have to follow the international interest. You have to follow the, the, the principles of solidarity, fairness, uh, equity, et cetera, et cetera, and global solutions for everybody rather than for one or even a group of countries not even your country. So that's, yeah. that's, 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 that is big, big difference. And I can tell you that sometimes it also happens vice versa. You know, you may start your career internationally. Uh, you may feel that you are almost picking technically there professionally. And some people make a, a, a reverse decision at that moment. They go back to the country mm. and yeah. start to use their experience uh, in the, in, in, uh, for a good, for the, for, a, for the interest of the country. And that is not less challenging and not less interesting than jumping from mm. national to international. Yeah, but that's not what you did. And, and let's zoom on that side of your, uh, that, that momentum of, of your personal past, because in the early 2000s, you've led, laid the ground and headed the secretariat of the first, and I would say only international convention related to health which you manage uh, the secretariat of at the World Health Organization. I'm talking about the, the treaty about tobacco control that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, and I'm curious on knowing the lessons you drew 
from this experience of multilateral cooperation around, around health issues and how it, it does feed or inspire your reflections of today on the best options to design international cooperation on health. Thank you. Uh, in, 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 indeed, after a so few years after I moved from national to international career, I was elected, uh, and that is elected position, uh, as head of the International Treaty on Tobacco. And uh, for you, I think that people know, and our two participants know, but just to remind you that that is the uh, first and unfortunately the only global health treaty so far in the WHO's history. Uh, so in a way, I was the first head of the first treaty when I was leaving my position, by the way, there was a joke saying, you know, this cannot be repeated anymore because they may be second end of the first treaty of the first head of the second treaty, but the first of the first is something which happens only once. Uh, 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 saying that, I would like to emphasize that uh, I was put in a situation that it was not just a managing a secretariat, a body, et cetera, as a manager, et cetera, but because it was the first experience in WHO, not really know, knew how to work with the, with the treaties in public health because it was not considered as treaty-based area health. Uh, so I had somehow to be in a role of a pathfinder in, in a global health, in a, or for exploring new ways of working. Okay, everybody allowed it. We have a convention, every nice, but when that convention started uh, its implementation path, then the people understood that this is the first time as a public health cooperation is elevated to the level of international law. It has never happened. International legal obligations. One thing is have commitments, technical commitments, expert commitments, etc. The other thing is have legal commitments and legal obligations you know, to follow, which has never happened in public health. So it was a change of mindset, not only for us, but also for the countries who adopted that treaty. Uh, even for the enthusiastic countries who adopted the treaty, but finally, when it came to implementation, you know, uh, everybody realized that it's something fundamentally new in public health. So uh, that's why um, I, I would say that it was a very specific position which I was put and uh, uh, creating not just a, not just leading a body, but also uh, uh, being a, a pathfinder somehow in a, in a, in a new way you, you said in public health. That that role was putting you in the in in a position of uh, in the need of changing mindsets. Uh, it 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 it's like twenty years ago, but I'm sure it's a, such a, an important experience in your life that you can recall us of uh, anecdotes or stories of what it means to change the mindset of national leaders about the way they approach their own uh, public health uh, policy. Yes, first of all, uh, or for example, I was the only official in WHO who could go to the country and speak to a health minister or finance minister or economy minister or even to the prime minister, et cetera, and say, well, I appreciate what you think. I appreciate the difficulties you have, et cetera, uh, which normally WHO officials say. And then, the, the, then they say, well, how we can help you to, you know, to ensure that you, you, you can ensure your commitments. But uh, possibly the head of the convention was the only official in WHO who could say, but you have to, because your parliament has ratified this treaty. It's a legal obligation. It's not anymore a commitment. And that is a total change of mindset. You know, uh, uh, when you are a kind of new culture, you are uh, uh, in, a, in, in a global health cooperation. Uh, when I'm looking back now uh, to the implementation of this treaty or the treaty brought not only for me, but for the world, first of all, I can say that, of course, the many people speak about the big differences we have in tobacco control now. I mean, you, know, you, you see that, you know, the tobacco issue is totally different now compared to 20 years ago. Uh, but I would say that there are few other differences and uh, big uh, uh, achievements, which I would like to emphasize. First of all, the, the fact that itself, the framework convention uh, kind of, you know, showed that a, a public health treaty, a legal obligation, a legal treaty in public health is feasible. It was in the constitution of WHO. Theoretically, it was possible, but that constitutional power was never realized for, let's say, more than 50 years. So now we showed it is feasible, so we can be more ambitious in public health. Uh, the second thing is that we showed, the treaty showed that it, was, it is not only promoting tobacco control, but it also can protect tobacco control and tobacco issue among other interests of the governments 
which are somehow even sometimes even conflicting interests, etc. And finally, we can see that no, we are not anymore speaking only within one generation, by the way, one generation. We are not anymore speaking about just controlling tobacco. Now the courageous governments are speaking about ending tobacco. It's not anymore control of the ending tobacco, end yeah. game of tobacco. So this is very interesting change which has happened within only 20, 25 years. Yeah, and as you said, um, there is a generational change in between the two moments while when the, you started this leadership position and 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 today and in the in this period of time there also has been new type of uh, health disruptions and i'm of course referring to the pandemic we've been through over the past two years uh, which is also committing engaging us to reflect upon the necessity um, of another way of approaching global uh, public health uh, governance and as a, as, a, as a researcher at the Global Health Center of the Geneva Graduate Institute for International Development Studies, you also research and explore the possibility and options of shaping a, a pandemic treaty, right? And um, I'm curious about this idea and knowing how you would maybe not within WHO, but starting maybe at uh, the UN General Assembly, how do you feel like there is a way for this kind of idea of reinventing the way we, we approach current um, uh, public health issues at the global stage? I'm, I'm talking in the, in the situation where, where everyone knows we're in the midst of a crisis of multilateralism. Even the UN Secretary General says about, uh, talks about this. So how do you feel like uh, there is a way into the UN system for new ideas like this one, which would definitely need as much uh, uh, mindset as you, as, you, as, you, as you did achieve uh, for the tobacco treaty control? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I understand if I was put uh, in a position to speak or to suggest something in the UN level at the UN General Assembly level, what, what would have been my, you know, my response or my suggestion, something like that. Uh, you know that UN uh, is a universal organization and there is specialized organization within United States system, United Nations system, which is WHO for health. And uh, that's why the most health issues go to WHO. And, uh, but if you look at back at the last 10, 12 years, interestingly, the UN General Assembly started to look at health issues itself, not only delegating them to the WHO. And there were four or five, or I think six possibly, political resolutions on different public health issues recently, uh, uh, on non-communicable diseases, on tuberculosis, on antimicrobial resistance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, quite honestly, I'm not, very favorable of that path because if the UN starts to speak about the disease by disease approach or group of diseases, group of diseases, it may be endless and there may be competition why this or not that to put on the UN agenda. I think when it comes to the health issues, UN should be or could be a bit more horizontal, I think, a more, uh, more systematic in that case and leaving the pure health issues or, uh, you know, health, uh, specific health issues to the world health organization as it should be. Uh, if it was me, I would suggest that, uh, let's say if it was three proposals to make, I would suggest that first of all, UN uh, uh, shifts the language when it comes to health issues uh, from political commitment, which is the main language of the political resolutions they adopted on health to political responsibility. I think we have to elevate the language and uh, not just commitment, but responsibility. Uh, in that case, only the UN resolutions may be meaningful uh, and uh, being uh, having added value. I would put three areas. For example, I think uh, it should be political responsibility for health in all policies, because health is now embedded in almost in all policies. You know, in trade, environment, in human rights. Uh, you know, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think there there is a need for the UN to take this universal approach and speak about you know, how the health should be embedded, uh, health interest should be embedded and protected possibly and promoted within the other interests of the governments and how the health issue should be somehow reflected in other policies. The second issue I would suggest is, uh, of course, you know, the, the addressing the catastrophic health 
challenges uh, and not only pandemics. I think it should be a bit more universal approach and climate change and health is also here, for example. And uh, take one universal political approach to the catastrophic, not just global health challenges, but catastrophic global health challenges. I think this is another thing to, to suggest that the UN could take. Thank you. Thank you, Heik. And, and um, I would strongly uh, support what you said in, in referring to uh, previous masterclasses we hosted about health issues, including with, with uh, one of your probably former colleague of WHO. I'm talking about Dr. Um, uh, um, uh, who, the Assistant Director General for, for of the WHO, who is in charge of of um, the One Health approach, who is precisely connecting the dots between uh, natural, um, the health of ecosystems, and the health of uh, of uh, human uh, of humanity. In saying so, uh, it's important to enlarge the discussion and connect the dots with other aspects of this this uh, conversation. And therefore, I'm happy to bring uh, into our conversation. Uh, four leaders we also wanted to host to keep the, this conversation going and I'm happy to in an alphabetical order to call them and, and bring them into on, on the screen. Uh, Lucas Chamberlain is the head of uh, UNITE's uh, partnerships. UNITE is the World Bank uh, network of parliamentarians, parliamentarians uh, committed to health policies. Welcome Lucas and I'm happy to, to see you. And thank you for having accepted to replace uh, the executive director of uh, UNITE, who has been um, committed to last minute uh, professional um, demands. Uh, we also have Sophie Daoud, um, who is the, um, the executive director of uh, Future Leaders Network, our sister organization in, in the UK. And, and, and Sophie uh, was in, in 2021 the Y7 Summit uh, chair in London. She has been working a lot in involving the voice of uh, future generations in, in, in uh, public policy arena, just like we do now. Uh, I'm also happy to host um, Dr. Audrey Fontaine, who is a, 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 psych a psychiatrist on a, on a professional side, and she's a fellow of the Open Diplomacy Institute, and she also was a delegate to the Y7 Summit, but not in London 2021, uh, but in DC, Washington uh, 2020. Welcome, Audrey and Sophie. And uh, last but not least, I'm also very happy to bring in the group uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford, who is a cancer surgeon of a profession, but she sits uh, on the benches of the House of Commons in the UK on behalf of the Scottish National Party as a spokesperson for health issues and European issues. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, Philippa is one of the most brilliant parliamentarians for peace. She was uh, part of the 2020 class of our uh, network of MPs around the world. And she has therefore been appointed also member of UNITE, the, the World Bank's network that I just uh, mentioned in introducing Lucas Chambel. Welcome to the four of you joining us uh, around Haik uh, and Nico Gossian, the former harmonious uh, Minister of Health. And we will start, uh, we will keep discussing public policies about health in addressing this question first. Um, I'm turning back to Aik again, that uh, in saying that you're a strong, as I said earlier on, an ad a strong advocate for an international treaty and pandemics. Um, this is an idea that you've been, that we also strongly supported with the Parliamentary for Peace. Uh, that I'm happy to co-chair, and um, I would like to to know, based on your research uh, at the in Geneva, um, Hike, what's what would be the purpose of such a treaty, and how would such a treaty relate with the existing international instruments in the field of tackling pandemic issues? And then we will have uh, uh, a few questions and 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 other. Uh, insights from the rest of the group. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. And of course, the pandemic treaty is, is very broadly spoken now. It is a very interesting topic and many, many people and negotiations already have, formal negotiations have started already. And uh, two, three main questions being asked around are the following. One is why you need a pandemic treaty. I would say uh, for two reasons. One, because the international instruments which exist now, the international health security system just failed. 
you know, when it came to COVID. You know, it is very nicely working in other cases, but when it came to COVID, it, it really failed. Uh, we know that, that it, it is not disputable. And the secondly, that, you know, the, the ordinary needs are globally binding rules to, to confront the future pandemics. Of course, this is not about the COVID. This is about future pandemics. You know, we cannot use anymore that, that treaty for, for fighting COVID, but it is about the future pandemics. Uh, so we need globally uh, uh, global rules with the good enforcement and good accountability. And now the second question is being normally asked is, okay, how it relates to the existing instruments. Now the main existing instrument is the international health regulations under WHO, which really worked in many other cases. It worked in Ebola, in SARS, in other outbreaks, etc. But it didn't really work in, in, in COVID. We know about that. And that's why I think uh, the, there, are, there are a lot of analysis of this situation. Etc. And then we know that uh, you know the, uh, there are at least three benefits which the, the politicians and the diplomats and, and uh, the policymakers are accepting now. One is the political, of course, that the treaty will have a higher political profile and higher political acceptance than international health regulations, which are although legal instrument, but they are normally seen as a as a technical document under the health ministry's uh, yeah, responsibility. The second is the legal difference, because and this is very much linked to your role in the, in the parliamentarians and peace, etc. because the treaties, unlike international regulations, go to the parliaments for ratification. Once they go for ratification, they become a kind of, you know, they trigger multi-sectoral, not only commitment, but multi-sectoral obligations also, because every ratification is then followed by the cascade of the national laws to kind of to domesticize the, the international law into the, the domestic environment, etc. And those laws are binding not only the health ministry, but all other relevant ministries. So you see the, the political, legal and multi-sectoral benefits which uh, a treaty uh, will have compared with the international health regulations. And finally, there are issues according to the constitutional kind of, you know, uh, how say peculiarities of the WHO's constitution under which the treaties and the regulations appear, there are differences. You can see that the treaties can be adopted on any matters of WHO interest, WHO's competence, while the regulations can be adopted on, only on certain matters, which means that the, when you go for the treaty option, you can tackle much broader issues than if it's regulation, which is only for those issues which are specifically mentioned under the WHO's constitution. So that, these are the differences in benefits you can, you can think of. That's very important. And, and we speak about this ahead of uh, the World Health Assembly that will uh, bring together many of the players here in the, in the space to Geneva next week. One of them is Dr. Philippa Whitford, who is indeed, as you said, uh, um, a key player here because as a, as, an, as a member of the parliament in the UK, she would have to vote about the ratification of such a treaty. And that's why I'm turning to Philippa and knowing um, what would be your expectation of such a, of such an initiative, um, and and what type of content you would you would um, um, uh, you would expect from such a, from from such a treaty, and what would be the the key criteria you would uh, use to assess uh, such a text if it would come to the UK Parliament? Well, I think, as uh, Heike has said, anyone who has looked at how the international community has dealt with COVID has to admit that we failed utterly. Uh, we had very warm words in spring 2020 about taking a global response to a global crisis, and we didn't see that. We saw that wealthy countries hoovered up diagnostic tests, protective equipment for medical staff, and later hoovered up vaccines. And COVAX and the technological transfer systems that were set up by the WHO struggled because wealthy governments just didn't really commit to them. We also have been debating the idea of a TRIPS waiver to allow countries in the global south to even produce their own vaccines. And that debate has now been continuing for a year and a half, more than a year and a half. So we have been frittering away the time when we could have actually been working on bringing this pandemic to an end 
arguing among ourselves. Now, I think there, there is already a reaction against this treaty in some countries with the idea that the treaty would, would literally tell every health service, every government, every single thing that they had to do. And of course, I would not expect it to be that at all, in that what we have to agree is the high level principles of what our aims are and how we ensure that fairer response. And, and there's so many lessons that we need to learn from this. And if you look back through the 20th century, we've had an epidemic that could have become a pandemic in virtually every decade. So the next pandemic may not be 100 years away, it could be 10 years away. So there's, there's a great urgency about how countries work together multilaterally to take that global response of sharing what we have, sharing knowledge, technology, access to resources to deal with a threat like this. And I would hope that out of the discussion and the crafting of that treaty, we might actually then start to develop structures that would take us further to, you know, we'll come on to it in question two, but, you know, Haidt touched on it, the health in all policies, the well-being approach, because I think mm. populations across the world are looking for something more radical as we recover from COVID. And the thing that depresses me about how we failed over COVID is climate change is a much bigger challenge. So if we can't work together for a few years on this, or learn to work together on specific health challenges in the future, how on earth are we going to develop the ability to truly cooperate and support each other on our small planet? So I, while I would hope that it will be focused initially, it will be high level, it will be principles, I would hope that actually the, the work involved in developing it might actually strengthen some of our multilateral bodies to go further for the world's population. Thank you so much, Philippa. And indeed, we will come back to the well-being uh, issue that you've raised. But um, uh, the principal approach and, and uh, the, 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 the solidarity and, and sharing approach that you've designed sounds like it's also what was the claim of the 2021 uh, Y7 leaders that um, uh, Sophie did bring together in London uh, last year. Um, Sophie, could you tell us about what uh, what what came out out uh, of the London summit uh, from the Y7, and and does it echo what Philippa just said? Yeah, thank you so much, and it's been a pleasure to be here on the, on this panel amongst my esteemed panelists. So thank you for inviting me. Um, so for those of you who, who aren't aware, I'll, I'll just give a bit of background about what the Y7 actually is. Um, so the Y7 is the official youth engagement group for the G7 Heads of State Summit. And um, what happens is um, roughly between four and five young leaders from each of the G7 countries, um, plus the European Union, is selected. They then consult young people in their, in their home countries, and then they come together to negotiate um, a series of recommendations that are then presented to world leaders and um, ministers on various different tracks. I think what was really interesting um, about last year is we very deliberately took um, a lens of future generations. And that was really important to us because we'd encountered a couple of challenges, I guess, from, from some of the politicians in the past, which was kind of, why should we care what young people think about um, diplomacy, about international security? Like, you guys aren't the experts, so why should we care? And we took the very deliberate choice of saying, well, actually, we care because, well, you should care because we will be inheriting those decisions when they come down the line to us. And taking that kind of long-sighted lens meant that we, we approached lots of the problems that we were facing in this kind of long-term sustainability lens. And actually what was really interesting across all of our recommendations was actually there needed to be an increased focus on the root causes and not just on the symptoms. And I think there's there's a couple of you know, really interesting um, points here. So um, the first is that when it comes to pandemic preparedness, um, actually amazingly pandemic preparedness and vaccine distribution um, was was actually they were only the second and third most important thing um, to young people, at least in the United Kingdom. Um, they got trumped by mental health. <laughs> and I think this is where you can actually start to see that people were recognizing that the pandemic was crucial, but actually we need to be thinking more collectively about 
systemic, holistic health of individuals and a real recognition that mental health is one angle um, that, that was actually neglected. And I'm pleased to say that um, Philippa, um, or maybe pleased is the wrong word, but um, uh, young people in Scotland um, actually most prominently felt um, that mental health was the, their biggest issue. But if I can just come back to kind of pandemic preparedness and, and vaccine distribution, what was so interesting is that at least young people in the UK were split about whether the, the world should take a more global approach or a more national approach to solving pandemic preparedness. And I think that highlights, as Philippa and Hike have, have just talked about, uh, like a failure of, of global leadership to actually take a global solution to this problem. And what we found was that young people are increasingly dissatisfied, increasingly frustrated at seeing these big problems coming down the line, seeing the next pandemic, seeing climate change, seeing the mental health crisis coming down the line and world leaders are not taking action on it. And so a lot of the recommendations that came from our young people were really about kind of changing that systemic narrative and tackling the real issues, looking at social determinants of health, looking at the origins <laughs> Of, um, of kind of zoonotic and uh, uh, other diseases. And that was the real emphasis that young people were coming up with. Let's not just focus on the here and now, let's think about the road ahead. And I think that really resonates with what, what Philippa and, ha and Hike have just been, been saying, but very much supported from a youth perspective. Thank you so much, Sophie, for being so so clear cut on what were the expectations of the Y7 delegates last year. And I'm, as we are today uh, in the opening day of the Y7 summit in Berlin for 2022, uh, I'm sure this echoes very much what is being discussed uh, um, in, in, in the other side of Europe um, uh, today, today, too. I'm turning to Lucas because what Sophie said was, it does sound like a bomb in the international system, which doesn't work like we expect as young generations to work. And as the head of Unite's partnerships, you are working within the or at least close to the World Bank and trying to bring together uh, MPs from all across the globe to sustain coordinated public policies uh, for health. How do you see progress making into uh, steps forward uh, into the direction that Philippa and, and uh, Sophia have, have pointed out? Yeah, so thank you very much. Just uh, uh, some appointment to, to let you know that we are not part of the World Bank and IMF. We are like an independent organization of parliamentarians to, to fight uh, infectious diseases and global health as a whole. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with these panelists. Um, and I think we are seeing that we have an opportunity in our hands, but also a responsibility. So I think we were never so much prepared to discuss something like a global pandemic treaty or convention, a mechanism that could help us uh, to deal with these type of threats. And I think also from a parliamentarian side and uh, from our secretariat, what we've been seeing is that, of course, we have champions on this matter, like Honorable Filippo, that it's here, that it's an amazing ambassador for these causes. But we are seeing that parliamentarians that never thought that much about health, that were not concerned about these topics, are getting aware of this and are much better prepared to discuss this. And we must seize this opportunity. Because I think what, what would be the worst thing to happen is for us to be discussing these 20 years from now and realize that we could do much better at this moment. And it, it is a threat and I think we should do better. And for these parliamentarians and also policymakers to be more aware, we understand that they are much more concerned now with these uh, global health issues. And we should seize that, that moment because we are trying to reach a global commitment and it is, a tremendous challenge, of course, because to build consensus around this topic, it will not be an easy task. But bear with me, even if we manage to succeed uh, in having a global mechanism to try to fight pandemics and, uh, and threat as a whole, even if we manage to do it quickly, because now it's the time to do it, after that, I think we need to realize, okay, in a practical way, in our national context, what did it change? So that is the role of national parliaments, of national authorities also, when the global architecture joins and discuss these topics and agrees in a consensus, now we need to build the right framework. And I think from our perspective at UNITE, that will be the main focus of our activity to understand in terms of ratification and everything, how can we apply this roadmap 
this legis this international law, as uh, Honorable Hike was was mentioning, and how can we make that into specific uh, changes in our national context, knowing that one size does not fit all. So the concerns that one country has and the mechanisms to solve and to go uh, to the objectives of a uh, global pandemic treaty are not the same in Rwanda as it's in the UK as in Portugal. So they are different. Um, that that's very important to to recall what United Nations mean, a group of nations with very very different backgrounds and history and cultures and and institutions and that is why it's also so frightening because it takes time to achieve such a big challenge that uh, we've been uh, speaking about for the last uh, quarter. Uh, and I, I'd like to turn back to uh, Haik for another round of questions and, and, and launch uh, another set of uh, discussion. We rarely address the same, um, the same type of, I mean, the, the, the pandemic risks that we've been through has social economic consequences that are very rarely documented and do not appear as much as they should in statements. Um, some say, for example, that the COVID crisis has brought us, uh, brought us back 30 years um, uh, ago in achieving the SDGs, for example, and that is not stated enough. So I, I like to zoom on the way such a treaty, because we have been speaking about holistic approaches, how uh, would such a pandemic treaty also encompass those social economic aspects? And according to you, what would it mean in terms of ownership and leadership of such an organization, of such a, um, a legally binding instrument? Would it mean that it could have a secretariat that is, would, would be shared with, by WHO with other international bodies like the International Labour Organization, the UN Development Programme, or the UN Environmental Programme. What, what, what would it mean to have a, a purely holistic approach of what um, a, a truly sustainable health policy would mean? Well, thank you very much, Thomas. This is a very interesting question because really uh, the, the, the social economic consequences themselves are really being discussed. I think there is no much dispute about that the pandemic also had the catastrophic consequences for you know, for uh, businesses, for transport, for tourism, for social protection, for jobs, uh, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. What is really being disputed or less discussed, whether the pandemic treaty should address those issues or not, because the, the common, uh, common, let's say, understanding is that, well, pandemic treaty is a health treaty. These are not health issues, why the pandemic treaty should address them. Uh, but let me say that. If you really look at those social economic issues as separate social economic issues, yes, it's easy to say pandemic treaty or, or, or a pandemic solutions are nothing to do with that. Okay, this is happening. There are other mechanisms, other organizations to deal with. But if you look at the linkage between health and those economic and social issues, you know, then, then it's difficult to deny that you should address them. Uh, let me bring two examples only. One, for example, if you don't have a minimal social safety nets, minimal support to the families, to the countries, it's difficult to accept or to expect that they will, they will adhere to public health advice or to lockdowns or restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. I, you need to supply with something very minimal. You know, you cannot just uh, give lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. Or secondly, everybody knows how the social economic factors and determinants and pushing people into the poverty how catastrophic they are affecting health outcomes of the countries. So if you really now you know, don't look at these issues, you say, okay, those are social economic issues, nothing to do with health. But if you look at back how they will affect the national outcomes of the pandemic, it's really catastrophic. So you cannot deny in that case that you need to address those issues. That's why I think we need to not speak about social economic you know, uh, consequences uh, per se, but we need to speak about the linkage between health and those issues. And in that case, it's difficult to deny that the health city should address also those issues, et cetera. Now, how to address? That is another thing. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm now remembering the tobacco issue. Tobacco is also has many outside of the health, health issues, you know, trade, you know, environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we did, we just invited these other organizations to come and participate in the negotiations as observers, but also bringing uh, input. I think the pandemic treaty needs even, even broader involvement of the UN sector than the tobacco treaty had. You know, I think the, the WHO 
and the intergovernmental negotiating body should make a courageous decision to invite the relevant UN organizations to the negotiating table. And with not a, a negotiating voice, but with a credible uh, uh, advisory voice and technical voice to bring solutions to advise, et cetera, et cetera. And the second mechanism, which is very important to look at, we should think that the, we should understand that the pandemic treaty will not be in the vacuum. There are already many legal instruments already in those other fields, which are already ratified. They're already in force. You cannot deny them. They're already ratified by the same governments. So instead of speaking about the contradictions, possible contradictions between a health treaty and those treaties, we need to look at the synergies between those treaties and the other treaties, environment treaties, trade treaties, human rights treaties, and labor treaties, et cetera, et cetera. That's why one needs to scrutinize these treaties find the synergies and possibly even the places when we need to create the bridges to these treaties and reflect them in the pandemic treaty. So to bring these legal, environmental, trade, human rights, et cetera, issues, uh, legal issues into a health context, but not trying to invent, uh, I, I, can, 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 not trying to intervene in those treaties which are already adopted, you cannot, but to create bridges and reflect them in your own public health treaty. So this is another thing. And the, finally, you ask whether secretariat could be joined to one or not. There is one example in health already when there is a joint secretariat. There is a protocol on water and health, by the way, adopted in London in 99, which has a joint secretariat between WHO and the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for, for Europe uh, because uh, of the environment issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I don't think that model may work for a pandemic treaty because the, in that case, we have two distinct areas, health and environment. Here, we have much more areas. I cannot imagine bringing all these organizations into one joint secretariat, but rather the joint, uh, it should be secretariat, uh, possibly uh, affiliated under, not, you know, not reporting to WHO, but under you know, WHO's administrative structure, like the, in, in the case of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, but also working very closely, possibly even having formal agreements to work closely with other international organizations and relevant international treaties. That's, this could be the solution, most probably. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ike. In, in, with, with your answer, we've been deep diving into the um, world of international organizations, which uh, sometimes sounds very far, far away from the way we approach our daily life. Um, and and I'm, I'm connecting the dots with our daily lives in turning to um, Audrey, because uh, as I said in my introduction, Audrey uh, was um, uh, a, a delegate to a former Y7 summit uh, in, in 2020 um, in, in Washington DC where the pandemic was already being discussed because it was the, the year of the pandemic, I would say. But she's a psychiatrist as a, as a, as a medical doctor and, and within the realm of um, social economic consequences that we need to assess and fully grasp uh, as a lesson to be drawn from this pandemic is clear the mental health issue. And I, I would like um, Audrey, Audrey to you to help us to, to understand what it does mean of uh, having a new branch of health policy that could emerge because it, there is no policy, health policy about mental health, for example, in any nation. It's an emerging topic that the Y7 and Y21 delegates have been very strong advocate for. But as a psychiatrist, you've been working on this and you've seen it at the forefront, at the, at the edge of this emergence. And I'd, I'd like you to explain a bit more on, on what, what is the expectation from our generation in that, in that field. Um, thank you very much, Thomas, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so yeah, definitely to answer your question, um, there is a huge um, fear from young people according, regarding their mental health because the confinement, quarantine processes and the, the socioeconomic aspects with some risk for the jobs, it's very um, harsh on their mental health, so they can be depressed, facing some stress, etc. And I, I know Sophie mentioned that also earlier because the Y7 2021 also discussed it. Um, so yeah, definitely it is uh, an expectation from young people to see mental health policies uh, on the national and international levels. Um, what is really uh, intricated is that the socioeconomical aspect and the 
um, the organization of the health system would have an impact on also the mental health of people. So for instance, if, if we would invest on health system strengthening, then we will have less issues um, regarding health in some countries, especially in the lower middle income countries, and people will be less scared regarding some aspects. And it's the same with the social economical aspects and with the job aspects. Um, and as you said, I am a psychiatrist and I do have this specific uh, fiber for young health professional who have faced major issues uh, during the COVID crisis, especially my fellow colleagues from low, from low and middle income countries who were facing where I was vaccinated for months, they were still waiting for vaccines and they had to go frontline and to face a disease and to try to help other people knowing that they would be at risk of catching something. Uh, it's the same for young people and it was also the same for older health professional. Um, but when you're starting a new career and you're facing such issues, then you may want to reconsider. Um, the same way with the gender lens, 70% uh, of the workforce is female. However, the personal protective equipment are not necessarily fit for a female uh, face. Uh, so basically when you wear a mask that is supposed to protect you, it protects you less if you are a female than you are if you are a male. So it's kind of complicated when you start thinking about the job you want to take and it may, I don't know, it may make you want to change career and think to something else. So this questioning about job issues, it also exists with a young health professional. So definitely there are a lot of issues regarding mental health, both for young health professionals and young people uh, across the world that have been triggered uh, by the COVID crisis, but they were already existing. And we hope that the light that is now on mental health issues would help having the, the right policies and the correct access to mental health issues and maybe also uh, leveraging some of the stigma around mental health. That, that is very important you say, uh, those are all not new issues. Those are issues that have been put on the spotlight with the crisis, but indeed those are um, items we had on our agendas for years. And, and, and another way of phrasing it is that uh, the, the question, the notion of having a, a, a holistic approach of our health policies has also been in the air for years with this notion of well-being that we touched upon earlier on. And I'm, I'm turning to Philippa because as an MP and especially uh, with the Wellbeing Alliance that Scotland is part of, you've been uh, uh, pioneering for uh, another approach of health policies that has a broader sense. And I would like you to explain what it would mean, according to you, to have a, a more cross-cutting uh, uh, public policy for health. Well, Sophie earlier spoke about the social determinants of health and, you know, being aware of those for decades. Poverty is the biggest single driver of ill health. And I remember a figure that is scored into my brain from an inquiry we did in 2016 about welfare cuts in the UK, that the UK loses 1,400 children a year under the age of 15 as a direct result of poverty from many different uh, final causes, but ones that are all strongly connected to poverty. So, you know, that is a big issue that we haven't dealt with. And whether you're in a wealthy country or a low income country within that country, it will still be that poverty is a bigger driver of ill health. And we heard a lot of comment at the beginning of COVID, oh, it's a great equalizer. It will impact on everyone. And we've seen completely the opposite. It has been poorer communities. It has been people on low income, frontline jobs, key workers who've, who've faced COVID and have often had the repercussions of it. We know the economic impact of the pandemic is in the trillions, and yet health system strengthening in low and middle income countries would have cost billions. And we discussed that, uh, this at a, a recent Unite event. So this is where the, the kind of more global approach to it would come. But of course, once you get into what you mean by well-being, you then start to look at national things. And that is, I spent three and a half decades on the front line as a trauma surgeon, general surgeon, breast cancer surgeon. But when you spend a long time treating people one at a time, you gradually realize that you are bailing out a boat that has a big hole in the bottom. 
And most of the things that would actually generate well-being are nothing to do with health services. I get asked to speak about health a lot, and people in the UK mean the NHS. But actually, health is that your mother had enough to eat and lived in a warm, dry house, that you had a decent start in life, that you were well nourished, that you were cared for, that you had a decent education, that you're not living in poverty. And so it's a lot of other policies. And this is this idea that I talked about health in all policies. And in Scotland in 2018, they founded the Wellbeing Economy Governments Group with Iceland and New Zealand, others like Finland and Wales have joined, but there are actually many countries, most of them smallish countries, who are trying to look at well-being. In Scotland, we have a national framework on well-being. In Wales, they have a Future Generations Act. And it's if we think of health in that holistic way of the well-being of a person, their physical and mental health, their economic, social and environmental well-being. And when we say environment, we don't just mean the planet, we mean their home, we mean the housing estate they live on. And, and that's the shift that we need in national politics. And we also need it internationally. When, we, when I was part of the P4P in 2020, and we were looking at how do we reduce the tensions that drive conflict? If people have a sense of enough, if people feel secure, if they and their families have enough to eat, you drive less conflict. And we could be learning from low-income countries who have stronger communi uh, communities, who have better intergenerational relationships, that often in our highly developed consumerist populations, we have lost. We all know we need to be somewhere different by the end of this decade, or we will eat the planet. And I think the public expect politicians and world leaders to come up with a radical new way of doing things, not to go back so that everything flows towards the wealthy, but to look at sharing within our countries and sharing across the planet and taking that holistic view. Thanks, Philippa. And in saying so, I do recall that as an MP, you've been elected in, in the Glasgow era, uh, which brings us uh, to the highlight event of the COP26 climate that took place a few months ago, which was precisely also uh, relating to another mental health and, and, and health um, question, which is uh, the climate issue. Uh, I'm turning this to Sophie because within the Y7 approach that you developed last year, uh, the reasons why, we, why you talked about mental health was not only the social economic consequences of COVID, uh, for some youngsters which could not emancipate themselves and develop themselves, but also because there is a bigger fear than COVID, which is the, the climate crisis. And I'd like you a bit to, to, to tell us about this and how it has shaped your vision of what mental health means politically. Yeah, thank you. And I, I just wanted to kind of echo everything that Philippa just said. I don't know whether you could see me nodding profusely um, throughout the entire time you were speaking. Um, so very much when we talked to young people, we asked them what they were worried about. What was the driver behind this? Again, coming back to that kind of root cause approach. And as Philip has already mentioned, the biggest drivers of mental health issues are actually economic instability. They are kind of insecure home or family life. Um, they're also climate anxiety. So eco-anxiety is huge. There have been plenty of studies around the world showing that around 70% of, of young people feel that they are frightened about what's coming up ahead. Um, they are worried about the impact on the planet and that kind of level of anxiety is rising. I think what's really interesting is that through that we were able to start talking about mental health in sort of the same light as climate change now they are very different problems but actually when you talk about them the solutions often are at kind of very different scales so when you talk about climate change people talk about global action when you talk about mental health people talk about training more mental health nurses or you know investing more in local hospitals and as a result what you get is kind of global solutions to mental health though we can discuss whether they are sufficient sorry global solutions to climate change and local solutions to mental health and that is absolutely not the way that we will solve these issues and it was so interesting when we spoke to g7 leaders they would say why is the why is the y7 talking to us about mental health like go talk to your own parliaments we don't like we don't want to talk to you we don't care 
And we had to keep coming back to the fact that the causes of mental health issues are global problems. They are the global economic instability. You know, the cost of living crisis that we are all experiencing now that is driving millions, billions of people into poverty. That is a global issue that won't just be solved by national parliaments alone. Um, same thing with the kind of the way the labor market works right now, you know, poor working conditions, all of those things, you know, the UK could change something and great, you know, like everybody either jumps ship from the UK or comes to the UK. We won't solve this problem unless we work collectively to solve some of these problems. And that was actually what I was really surprised by was this, this was a bit of a surprise to the politicians that they had never thought about the drivers of mental health all they were talking about was like, oh, well, you know, we'll we'll schedule 60,000 more, you know, e-telephone consultations for young people with um, with a mental health practitioner. Don't come to us for that. Go to your local parliament. And I, I think politically we need to reframe some of these kind of health issues in a different way. And I, I just want to kind of do a final little plug here that there is a bigger disruption that we haven't yet talked about, which is digital disruption to health. Mm -hmm. You know, we we are in an age where we should be thinking about how you know, the digital transformation should also be transforming the way we offer health services and the way that health is monitored and, and supported. And there is such a great opportunity in that. And there is such a great risk. And again, we won't solve that <laughs> until we do it globally, because what we'll end up with is with pockets of good practice and pockets of bad practice. And so I do think we just, as, as kind of we've been taught, your question asked, like politically, we need to reframe lots of these issues as kind of personal things, one by one to global things that we need to solve together. Thank you so much, Sophie. And, and uh, I, I must witness that uh, when I chaired and uh, actually founded the Y7 and uh, Y20 uh, summits in 2011, I can testify that bringing young youngster voices within global governance was madness and that they were purely focused on economic manage crisis management and that such a holistic approach was not at all on the agenda. There is a bit of change since we adopted the SDGs at the UN General Assembly in 2015, because it connects the dots within each other. But indeed, uh, there is still a lot of, of, of changes uh, of mindset, and that's another proof of leadership uh, from youngsters uh, to, 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 to make happen. Which brings me to the third question uh, that I'll, I'll ask to uh, Haik, but I know that Philippa is committed to a parliamentary um, uh, uh, scheduled constraint that she will leave us from now, I guess. Uh, and I, I would like to thank her. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Philippa, for having been with us. And, and good luck for the World Health, uh, Health Assembly next week, where you will meet Lucas for sure and Haik for sure, too. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. Bye. And I, so the, this idea of a pandemic treaty is, um, uh, as we've seen from different perspectives, is a very politically sensitive issue not only for the social economic uh, aspects that we've uh, just discussed or the legal aspects that you outlined in your first answer, but because also there is a ge geopolitical challenge behind this idea in the context that uh, this invasion of Ukraine has put new yeah, new barriers, new frontiers within the UN system. If you look at the votes of the UN Security Council, there is not as there is not there was no vote about um, COVID at the UN Security Council where we could have expected it uh, over the past two years. Uh, when you look at the UN General Assembly, there, have, there has been a resolution, but the world is divided um, um, about the issue of uh, Russia invading Ukraine. So I'm, I'm curious on knowing your assessment of yeah, the impact that the COVID crisis and, and now this crisis has had about the um, increasing distrust uh, that there is within the UN system and the multilateral system, and whether it led us a chance to effectively uh, deliver uh, with global health diplomacy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Indeed, it's a big challenge. Uh, it's complicating the things, but I'm let me say I'm a big believer of uh, the successful outcome of the negotiations. 
uh, for two reasons. First of all, when you look at the, the role of health diplomacy, and negotiations are health diplomacy, global health diplomacy, uh, uh, there are, of course, very well-known functions of global health diplomacy, which is promoting protecting health, creating governance mechanisms, creating alliances, supporting donor relations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are also two other uh, functions of global health diplomacy, which are less discussed, but they are very obvious. One is contributing to peace and security as a soft power. A second is even uh, improving relations between countries. Uh, uh, let's remember some historical examples of the US and the USSR. Can you imagine US and USSR collaborated for the eradication of the smallpox? And they successfully have done that. China and US both worked at the same time uh, 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 for solving the Ebola issue. Uh, look at some medical diplomacy issues when some countries are using the, the medical diplomacy to improve relations or their image at least, you know, in other countries, like the mask diplomacy, which was, you know, exercised by China, or the Cuba sending medical teams to other countries, etc., and creating good relationships, etc., which means that the health as a soft power is more uniting than dividing. And even if it divided it all, uh, the health can be uniting factor. But let me remember also the case for the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The negotiation for FCTC started in 2000 and ended in 2003. And what was in between? It was 9-11 in 2001. So the negotiation started in totally different multilateral climate and ended in, in, in a different one, but they were successful uh, because it was a global health threat which was threatening everybody. And by the way, there was also the same political divides, I saw now similar political divides. There was a big issue of equity again, as now, the scandalous issue of equity in a pandemic. That time it was around, you know, a growing epidemic in the developing countries and the developed countries more or less coming out of the epidemic at that moment already. And the big industrial differences and interests, etc. big countries hosting the tobacco industry, not very much interested in a strong control developing countries struggling because of that. But at the end of the day, within three years, this treaty was negotiated and adopted the first ever global health public health treaty. That's I'm, I'm a, a bit optimistic and I'm a believer of the United, uniting power of health, in, even in a very problematic geopolitical situation. Thank you, Aik. And, um... Before we we ask uh, to Sophie and Audrey, who has been who have been um, delegates to to the Y seven uh, summits, I'd like to ask Likas how he assesses or sees those emerging and increasing tensions within the Unite Network. Does it does it brings together the parliamentarians uh, that uh, committed to Unite, or do you feel like there is in, there is still difficulty to make to make it through? And how do you feel that the next, uh, the upcoming World Health Assembly will, will um, develop in this context of a war that also contains a lot of uh, concerns about the health um, issue in Ukraine, uh, because war uh, is, has touched more than 100 hospitals down there, and there, there is a very serious concern of having new uh, variants coming from Ukraine if, if its uh, vaccine coverage, for example, is, is decreasing. So I'm asking you those questions to kind of anticipate what disruptions, geopolitical disruptions could, could, uh, could, could happen uh, and, and what impact they could have within the, the health uh, multilateral organizations you're part of. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. And uh, it's curious because uh, as Hype was saying, I'm, I'm also optimist, so uh, I, I will not get a negative perspective here. So I think one thing that we have to acknowledge in the situation that we are facing at countries understand that no one is safe until we are all safe. So and that's we have to take advantage of that. So, of course, and within UNITE, so just for you to understand, we have um, presence in more than 80 countries. We have more than 220 members and we've been working with them in the pandemic treaty. And honestly, from our perspective, it's not a matter of uh, uh, talking 
uh, being the voice of the parliamentarians, but whether to give the tools for parliamentarians for them to make the right decisions within their context. And what we've been seeing is that they are really eager to learn more about the pandemic treaty and global health. I think we are really in an early stage of the treaty and most of parliamentarians were not aware of what was happening. And this is a problem, of course, for UNITE as we exist, that's our role, but the formal mechanisms for the parliamentarians to be aware that this is happening and that, that sh they should have like a voice on it, it's not working quite well. So what we've been seeing is that we all have a role playing in this system. So things that we are doing here and for us at UNITE and at the World Health Assembly, we are having bilateral meetings between countries. We are having sessions with partners that are specialized in uh, the pandemic treaty. So I think that that will be the main strategy is for us to understand that at this time that we are discussing global public health, we all have a, a role to play within this uh, environment and in within our organizations, we also have a responsibility. So from the feeling that we get in the international context and within the parliamentarians, there is a will to discuss the treaty. But of course, we know that we need something, we need a mechanism, but we are sure that in the meantime, countries will have different perspectives. So they will choose different paths to arrive at the same destination that it's to have a framework that would allow us to be more prepared for the first time, because we cannot avoid outbreaks. We'll have them, but we can avoid pandemics. And I think parliamentarians are more aware of that. And for the question that you make about Ukraine, also we are realizing, and we work with that uh, around our, our network, is that we realize that it was more than just a war. It was beyond bullets. It was a war beyond bullets with health consequences from, from vaccination, from waterborne diseases. We still have a responsibility to play. It's not just like armies fighting. We need to work with international organizations also. And we are working with our parliamentarians there. And we release a special address for all, all the network to realize that we will have consequences in the health of the citizens and not just in Ukraine, but also in the other countries that will receive uh, people that are escaping wars. So. Thank you, uh, Lucas. I, I'm reminding our audience that you can ask questions on the chat. Don't use the Q&A um, module, but rather use the chat. It's easier for me to take them. There are many connections to be made with the environmental uh, aspects, with the economic aspects, with regional aspects. So feel free to ask your questions. I'll distribute them to the panelists. Um, but uh, before we get there and have the Q&A session with the audience, I'll ask to ask to, I would like to ask the same question to um, uh, Audrey and Sophie and that order on how you assessed um, this issue of geopolitical tensions within the G G7 nations. Uh, we often say that the G7 is a like-minded group, but in 2020, while the Y7 met in DC, it was rather a G6 plus one, group and then the year after it came back to be a G7 group and it is supposed to be the cockpit of leadership for global governance so still there are tensions many of them uh, including between young leaders aside the, the, the G7 uh, groups and I'm curious to know with this chronological uh, analysis, uh, starting from Audrey, Audrey delegate in the 2020 summit, and then Sophie, chair of the, the 2021 summit, how you assessed this um, uh, geopolitical tensions around public health issues within the, the Y7 summits. Okay, so I will start with the 2020 uh, group. Um, so while we were in the middle of the pandemic or start middle of the pandemic when we regrouped uh, to discuss the policy recommendation uh, at the EU7 2020. And there were some countries that were more hit at the time of the discussion. So the people were feeling more involved maybe, but what we could very quickly see at least within the youth group is that there were some values on which we uh, agreed very quickly. And that was the motto of all our discussion, discussions afterwards. So the value of equity and the value of sustainability. Um, so even though there were at the time some countries uh, 
not the young people, but the countries and the leadership uh, saying things that were not always on the same line, but in the youth group, uh, the idea of equal access to health, uh, of health strengthening, um, of sustainability, and making sure that the decision that we're taking today to tackle the pandemic, or at the time, to tackle the pandemic would not jeopardize the future, but would also help improving the future. So being able to manage the short term and the longer term uh, objectives, that were values that we didn't, we didn't fight at all on that. Um, and we were very much aligned, but that was slightly different with the countries to be honest. So that's why I would completely, completely sorry, be, um, uh, I would completely agree with uh, Haik and Lucas before and saying that we could be optimistic uh, because at least at the young people level, it was very, very easy to align uh, on the same values. And if we align on the same values, then it might be easier to move from the words to actions. Thank you, Audrey, for enabling us to understand what happened in 2020. How did it change or evolve uh, from DC to London in 2021, uh, Sophie? So um, I think I'd, I'd probably say that the kind of the experience and the reflections that I have on the way that the young people work together on kind of the impending health crisis was very much in the spirit of Haik, Lucas, Audrey's um, kind of description of of kind of optimism right and I do genuinely think as, as kind of Hayek said that that like health unites us all we all have health and it's all kind of you know there's there's different local factors that are like uh, that affect you but I do think like inherently we are all human beings um we are all nourished or like underwatered we are all um you know like nourished in our soul and otherwise so I do think there's something really inherently great about that I, I guess the like the alternative perspective I would bring to this, which is that, you know, I do genuinely think you call the G7 the cockpit cockpit of global governance. I mean, the G7 has failed at that. It has failed at moral and political leadership on so many of these issues. And, you, you know, we can talk about this in the context of so many different things around kind of um, vaccine equity, um, around, you know, climate change um, ambition. It genuinely has failed at that. And you can blame geopolitics or you can blame what you want, really. Um, it still hasn't done its job. And so I think the angle I would bring to this is impatience. I think there is a real sense that actually, yeah, there are, you know, there are always going to be things. There are going to be things pulling in different directions. But we've been talking about the same things for many of these issues for decades now. Impatience for action. <laughs> Um, optimism is certainly there, but young people take that as the assumption. They take that as the status quo. Of course, we can solve these problems together. We just haven't so far. We haven't yet. And I think the real, like the sense that I get around impending health crises, around the impending like, climate crisis is actually, you know, why haven't we taken that step? Because it's not because we can't. As Heike has really aptly pointed out with the tobacco um, bill, you know, we we can the tobacco treaty. We can do this when we act together. We just have, for some reason, whatever we've chosen to see as our barriers, we have used, and instead, young people are saying, you know, the time is now. Yeah, and, and that brings me to one of the first question we got, and I'm asking to. I would say the four of you guys, um, and I ask to uh, with Hike, and then go to Audrey, then to Lucas, and then to Sophie, is that um, around this health crisis we've been through this pandemic, probably the most important thing, the most social fact that happened, was the increasing level of distrust within the international community, within society, within firms between governments and civil society, uh, between generations, etc. And I feel like the most the, the, the distrust has a health as a cost on our health. It lowers our confidence, it lowers our ability to project ourselves in the future, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I feel like probably when we talked about mental health or our own capability to deliver um, fight against the next pandemics, which, as Philippa said, might not be in the next century, but in the next decade, uh, trust within society at all layers of um, communities and international uh, spheres is key. How do you assess this level of increasing distrust in your own, I would say, spheres? First, Ike, then Audrey, and then um, Lucas, and then Sophie. 
Thank you. Uh, I think that this, this, this trust is driven not only by the general distrust to international organizations or international peers, et cetera, but also distrust to not only to institutions, but to instruments. Because the people don't like to see people just talking. They would like to see the people and organizations acting, for, but for acting, you need the instrument to act. You need a credible instrument. But for a credible instrument, you need to credibly negotiate the instrument. And, you know, and then for credible negotiating instrument, really, you need a credible inst institution under the umbrella of which you could do that. That's why I think the role of pandemic treaties in, in this kind of global crisis is, is, is really going even beyond the solving the problem of the pandemic or addressing the health issues. So, so it's also re, uh, resolving the issue of the trust to international system. So if you have a really credible instrument to which the people see is working, you know, then you start also to deal, deal with the institutions which are, you know, which worked for this instrument, which are implementing this instrument, etc. That's why, that's why I think it's, it's, it's an important issue to take into account, the pandemic treaty issue also uh, raising, raising, the, the, raising the possibly potentially the trust to the international system in general. Thank you, um, Heike. I'm, I'm turning to Audrey about the same topic. Um, yeah, sure. As I said earlier, um, as young people, we would like to see the words turning into action, uh, and Sophie mentioned it as well. Um, so yeah, definitely what would improve trust in the system would be to see that what we've seen so far as issues or things that were not working would work. Um, there might be some things already existing, treaties and, and uh, instruments that are not maybe, maybe not completely in place that maybe we can work in synergy with. Um, but the idea of having this, this new treaty or of having a, a legally binding treaty that would uh, improve uh, coordination within health system and improve um, the response to pandemic, what, what it would help for young people would be to see that countries can work together and that it's something that is doable not only through the treaty theoretically but it could be done uh, in action in a country so that we won't have the same conclusion as uh, like we could see I think it was April 2022 with the Act A facilitation council session where I think the numbers was like right now so in April 2022 only seven 13, sorry, 13% 13 of the population of low and middle income countries were vaccinated, April 2022. And we've been vaccinated in France, for instance, for most of the population for months now. Um, so that's something we don't want to see anymore. So that might, if we manage to change it, that might improve the trust in the system because we know that it should be able to do it. We have the capacities to do it. We just need to, we just need to do it now. Yeah, you just yeah, need to. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's not only about trust as getting results, which um, enable us to believe in the future, but trust also comes from transparency and accountability of each and every actor. Uh, in, in, in turning to the same, the same question to Lucas, I'm wondering on whether you, you would approach this treaty with um, legally binding clauses of transparency and accountability of the roots and origins of a pandemic, uh, like we couldn't have, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question because when the WHO um, diligented uh, an investigation about the origins of the COVID-19 crisis in China, we have heard all across the globe that there was a lack of transparency, of accessibility, of accountability of the reasons why this pandemic has been so long to take into account, et cetera, et cetera. So would, would such um, an approach of, uh, of trust building uh, be relevant to you? And, and certainly not relevant, but certainly more feasible within a pandemic treaty upcoming uh, in the coming months. Yeah, so like my uh, colleagues uh, said, I think it's important to have actions, follow up, on what people have suffered enough in this pandemic. So it, it has to have like an outcome that can protect them. And I think that's very important to build trust. And in terms of transparency, and I would link that also with this information because it was, it was like another virus that we had like during this pandemic and we don't have vaccine for it. And it was very difficult to manage. And if we want to have trust in the institutions, and it's very hard because people nowadays, and it's normal, they want like the fastest information. And usually our organizations are not able to, to provide that because we don't have the resources. And if we did, we would be uh, not telling the, um, the absolute truth. So I think we have to work on that, on transparency, on 
public hearings for the pandemic treaty and also to try to build this consensus with media with uh, policy makers that we we must do better if we want to for people to be ready when they have to think about health issues so imagine this so we were asking people to know a lot about vaccination and everything but we don't invest enough in literacy so we were not planning these and now we have problems of trust of this information because we didn't create the strong environment for people to have the literacy to allow them to know better and also to to, to trust the institution so i think we are starting the work on the pandemic treaty, but we also have to think how to communicate this with the people. They have to know, even in surveillance, in outbreaks, in pandemic preparedness, prevention, we have to communicate a little bit better for the citizens to know what we are trying to do here. Thanks, Lucas. That's a, a very clear answer. I'm turning the, the last uh, uh, response about the same question to, to Sophie about, what would trust mean for younger generations and, and, and the Y7 community in that context? Yeah, thank you. And I, I guess I'm going to speak not just on behalf of young people, I think, but as a, as a behavioral scientist a little bit here. Um, so, so trust is not given, it is earned. Trust is about a feedback loop that you behave, you kind of, you see someone's behavior, someone's behavior in response, and then you are kind of reassured that you will be able to rely on them again and again and again in the future. And it might be verbally, but it might be through genuine real action. So I wanna come back to this point that like, trust is not given, it is earned. And right now, the international community has not earned anyone's trust. I mean, like, I'm gonna take you back to like the G7. The G7 comes up with like a million different frameworks every year. No one remembers where they came from, what they've, what's happened to them. And the reality is no one's feeling their effects on the ground. Like you can have this lovely framework that all the G7 nations have committed to, but actually if you are, you know, a user, a health user in, in Germany, if you are a digital user in Japan, whatever you are, if you're not feeling the direct consequences of that back on your daily life, you are not, there's, there's kind of no trust being earned there. And I, I guess with the kind of international community, I do think like we need to kind of shift the game a little bit here so that we create the circumstances for um for trust to be given so imagine if no one got a vaccine until everyone got a vaccine and by that i meant imagine if the the, the producers of vaccines said until you guys have sorted out a global governance process we're not giving anyone anything actually i reckon quite a lot of people would have had a lot more pressure on international governments to to create a proposal by which everyone got a vaccine and actually i think we would have much better and more equitable um distribution of a vaccine vaccination across the world so we do think that like the international community needs to create those mechanisms because that won't happen by chance and that relies on the, you know, a, a very capitalistic society where a producer of vaccine is probably not going to instill that um, that demand on, on the global order. But I do think we need to create a moment by which people see the benefits of international decision making on them, on jabs in arms, on their mums, their dads, their brothers and their sisters. And once you see that, once you see the benefit of it, I think we will earn that trust again that, that we so vitally need. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I strongly appreciate it. You took the time, the four of you and Philippa too, to to tackle all this, all of these very complex questions. We are about to be on on time, and that's um, that's happy. We French people are not used to be on time, so I'm 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 taking it as a as a compliment for ourselves. Uh, I'd like to say to thank first. Um, uh, Dr. Haik Nikokosian, and, and wish you best luck in attending next week's uh, World Health Assembly. Um, now, as a researcher in policy uh, making decisions uh, and, and policy studies, uh, uh, we need um, thought leadership about what would be the content of such a pandemic treaty, and I'm sure we'll look back at what you, you've achieved there. Uh, uh, including at the Geneva Centre, uh, you, you're part of. Thank you so much, uh, Haik, for having uh, been uh, the keynote speaker of this masterclass. Thanks uh, to Lucas, Sophie, Audrey, and Philippa for having um, spent this uh, evening with us. I'll just take the few last um, uh, seconds that remains um, on the schedule to highlight a few numbers that we have not had the time to discuss that health is also about uh, nutrition and, 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 and today's crisis in Ukraine 
uh, risks uh, the increase of starvation of more than 280 millions of people as Russia and Ukraine are very important contrib con donors and contributors to the World Food Programme and it is a very, very critical situation. And that, in, in, and, and that health policies also include social protection and, 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 and health care for, uh, for women. Uh, and, and in this crisis and in this war we have seen the weaponization of rape as, uh, as, as a threat that happens on the ground in the war in Ukraine. And this is linking us to the next Global Leadership Masterclass, which is going to take place on next week at the same hours in the same format, in which we will, uh, I'll have the pleasure to host uh, Hosna Jalil, who has been the Deputy Minister for Women's Affairs in Afghanistan, uh, and also Deputy Minister for Interior Affairs I in the same country. Um, I'm very happy that we will meet her uh, next week uh, with four other prominent speakers to, to approach those very complex issues that are meant to help us achieve the Global Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you for being with us with the Open Diplomacy and thanks to our partners, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Global Affairs Canada and NG for supporting this masterclass. See you next week. Mm -hmm.